Okay, so we have Robin Hayes, who is the CEO of JetBlue. And by brief background, uh, he is a native of England, went to the University of Bath, got his bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering there, uh, joined British Airlines, was there for 19 years, uh, left there to go to JetBlue in 2008, and um, became the CEO in 2018. Is that right, CEO? In 2015. 15. And now you're the, the CEO, you were president and CEO, now you're the CEO solely. Yes. Okay, right? Yes, that's correct. All right. And um, he has three children, one of whom is in what I call the highest calling of mankind, private equity. Yeah. So you, you must be very proud of that, right? I am. Okay. He learned from my mistakes. Right. Okay. So um, let me ask you this. Uh, the airline industry, uh, since it began, seems to be an up and down industry. It's boom or bust. Uh, what is the state of it now? Is it doing reasonably well or is it not so great? Hasn't recovered yet from COVID completely. Well, I like, I like that old quote, you know, how do you become a millionaire? Start with a billion and buy an airline. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, I think, like, thankfully, the airline industry around the world is recovering. The good news is the recovery in the U.S. is probably a year to two years ahead of anybody else. So, you know, we actually think by the time we get to 2024, the industry will be fully recovered. Um, in other parts of the world, that recovery is still going on. So, and I think the support that we got from the U.S. government through the, the CARES Act was crucial to making sure this industry could come back in more quickly. Okay, so um, okay, so that support from the U.S. government, uh, to make it clear, they didn't just give you money and said do whatever you want with it. You had to pass the money through and affect your employees. Is that how it worked more, mostly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, what what it was was largely payroll support. So the money went directly to our uh, our word for crew uh, JetBlue, our word for employees, our crew members. Uh, it went directly to our crew members. And it meant that they could stay on the payroll, keep their travel benefits, not that there was much traveling going on at the time, uh, keep their pension benefits, as opposed to losing their career, going to uh, claim unemployment, which is still cost the government money, and then having to restart. And I know people were frustrated last year, and, and in many cases, rightly so, that as an industry, we did not manage the ramp up as well as we could. But I can't tell you how much worse it would have been. Um, and but there'll be, there would have been hundreds of airplanes retired uh, from the system that wouldn't still be back. So your airplanes are all Airbuses, is that right? They are. My friend Jeff is right there from Airbus. Okay. They're, okay. They're, they're, so, they're, they're very, they're beautiful, highly priced Airbus airplanes. I'm hoping Jeff is going to know. Jeff's great. Airbus are great. They've been with us since the beginning. But, you know, we could always do with a bit more of a discount, Jeff, please. Okay. All right. So um, right now, uh, you are what the, the, the United States airline industry is basically down to four big players. Yes. American, mm -hmm. United, yeah. Southwest, yes. and Delta. Yes. Okay. They have 80% of the market? They have about 80% of the market. Okay. So you're not one of the big four. What do you call yourself? You're a what kind of airline? Well, we we um, we call ourselves a, a low cost carrier. Low cost carrier. And okay. I think the unique thing about JetBlue is we're very proud that we can offer both low fares and great service. Okay. So how do you offer lower fares than the other people? I mean, you're paying your employees less. Your planes are not as well serviced. What what is the reason? What how can you do that? Well, we don't pay our people less. Um, All right. So um, what's the trick? Then? I, you know, I, I think uh, our aircraft utilization tends to be higher. You know, we have more um, we have uh, more modern airplanes. Uh, we're very efficient at what we do, and we are. We, we have to be very thoughtful where we make decisions and where we don't, and we have to focus on the things that matter most to our crew members and our customers. Right. On average, uh, you are ten percent, twenty percent lower than the big four in your pricing. Uh, on average, average fares are actually about fifteen to twenty percent lower. Right. And when people are selecting an airline, um, you must have done surveys. Are they selecting it because it's cheaper? It goes when they want to go. They like the uh, the, the the affinity club or the, the frequent flyer miles. They like the stewardesses. What what is it that they like? Yeah. All all of the above. All of that. Okay. No, I mean it, it depends on it depends on the it depends on the customer. But I would say you you've got to go to where you've got to go to where we want to go, right? That's right. And that's why we're excited about the spirit merger because we're going to do more of that. I I want to I want to low fare. 
because uh, you know most okay. of people okay. flying JetBlue are paying with their own money, uh, and I want to be treated with respect and have a great experience. Well, let me ask you about a quality problem. There have been problems with people going on airlines recently who have had fights with flight attendants, mm -hmm. attack them. Um, is this due to mental illness? Is it alcohol? Is it drug related? And it never seems as if the people who are doing these things go to jail in any uh, sentences that I've ever read about. What happens to these people? Well, first of all, I want to start by saying our crew members do an amazing job. We have a few in the room. Can you just stand? Because you guys are the best. All of you, come on. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's our crew members dealing dealing with these okay. terms. The good news is it's a relatively low number of people. Um, but when these challenges present themselves, especially when they happen in the air, I always say our in-flight crew members, you know, they are in the hospitality business, they're in the safety business, they're in the law okay. enforcement business, they're in the counseling business. They have to do all of those things. And, you know, they are successful more times than not in diffusing the situation. But we have had, you know, uh, and have continued to have too many of these incidents. And I think the masking on airplanes did not help. You know, it was such a polarizing thing. Right. I would say since that um, the mask mandate has gone, things have settled down a little bit. But we still need to, I, I don't know. I don't think it's a comment just about airplanes. I don't know if everyone agrees with me. I see it everywhere in society. You know, people are just less tolerant. They're less understanding. Uh, they're frustrated. And, and I think they kind of just right. take it out on people around have, them. Have you thought about... Um just not serving alcohol. Well, I could never fly again if they didn't. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think, so we try and, you know, we try and make sure when someone gets on an airplane, they're, they're okay. We try not to overserve. Most people treat treat alcohol very responsibly. It's a very okay. small number of cases. That right, so when you're about to take off or land, mm -hmm. uh, if you put your cell phone on, yeah. will the plane crash? I no. Mean, no. So why do they tell you, take your cell phone and, and put it away, and because otherwise you, you, the plane could crash or something like well, that. Well, so so you, you used to you used to have it turned off. Now you can have it in uh, flight safe mode, um, and I don't know how many people actually do that, um, but <laughs> but it's meant to be in flight safe mode. Okay, but, but you, the airplane is not going to crash. We're all good. Okay, so actually on safety, mm -hmm. um, the airline industry, commercial airline industry, seems to be in reasonably good shape these days in terms of uh, not having accidents and so forth. But there have been incidents recently where the air traffic control people have not told some planes that they were going to hit each other on the runway. Are you worried that our system is a little antiquated? So we do have a system that needs to uh, some technological upgrades for sure. Uh, you know, we are still using the paper strips to control airplanes. However, the system is safe. What happens is what happens is is when things start to overheat, if you like, or things start to get a bit busy. Uh, the, the system slows things down to make sure that the people working in the system, whether the controllers or anybody else can handle what's in front of them. So I think we should be proud in the US. We have an aviation system from a safety point of view that is second uh, to none. And, you know, we can't be complacent. We have to stay very focused. It's a great partnership uh, between all the stakeholders in the aviation business. Okay. Um, and it's worked really well over the years. Right. So in your airline, you have, where do you fly to? You fly a limited number of routes. What are your main routes? Uh, well, uh, our largest, uh, uh, our largest bases of operation or focus cities, as we call them, are in New York and Boston, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, San Juan, and LA. Now you also fly to London? We do fly to London, three flights a day. Okay. And are they full? Uh, actually four flights a day. Why did I forget that? Um, uh, are they full? Um, well, uh, they could always be fuller. No, they're doing okay. You know, we're in the uh, we're in the sort of uh, winter trough at the moment, um, but um, and the transatlantic business tends to be quite seasonal. Okay. But we're gonna have a great summer. Well, why why not have more routes? I mean, why don't you fly all around the United States? You have a model that works. Why are you on a limited number of routes? Well, uh, again, um, uh, that's a great question, and. You know, you talked about the big four earlier with 20%. We're 5% player. The, the bringing JetBlue and, and Spirit together and, and the amazing team at Spirit and Cred, Ted Christie, CEO is here. Uh, thanks for your partnership, Ted. Um, hey. 
Well, okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go from five percent to nine percent. So we better go to a lot more places. Well, Southwest started out the same way you did. How did they grow so successfully? With well, they 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 they, have, uh, they grew like we did organically for many years, but then they acquired Airtran too. So you know, Southwest and Moisair they acquired back in the day. So Southwest has also grown through acquisition. Right. So you are proposing to buy um, Spirit Airlines. Yes. Why, why do you want to buy them? Not well, that it's not a good airline, but why do you need to need uh, that? First of all, a, a great team. Uh, and, uh, you know, whilst we have different business models, both of us have teams of people that uh, are very proud of what they've done for the industry and are uh, proud to work as part of a values-driven culture. So, you know, most, most mergers fail because of culture. So the most important thing is culture. Secondly, fleet commonality. I don't want to make Jeff's head even bigger from Airbus, but, but they have Airbuses. We're going to have even more Airbuses. So, okay. And um, um, he just told me, by the way, the Airbuses are not made in Europe. They're made to some extent in Alabama, they are. And other places. So, yeah, uh, um, we have the same engines. And I say that because as a carrier that has to keep our costs down, that fleet commonality yeah. is very important. And finally, we don't have that much overlap. And so it's going to be complementary. It's going to allow us to fly to. Okay. Many markets we don't fly to right. today. You're a discount airline. Yes. What is Spirit? Spirit. So what they call Spirit is called a, an ultra low cost carrier. Ultra low cost. And we're called a low cost carrier. Right, low cost. So yeah. you are twenty percent below, let's say, the other people, mm -hmm. the big four. Mm -hmm. How much is Spirit below the big four or below you? So that their their average fares will be lower, um, but I think it's important to recognize that um, the largest percentage of people flying JetBlue want a low fare. We just have more business travelers, we have more other types of business that brings right. the average fare up. Now, the uh, government of the United States uh, has recently said uh, there are a lot of so-called junk fares that are, or fees, I should say, junk fees that are being added to the ticket costs. And so the government wants you to say, if you're going to charge me for bringing a bag on or bringing a dog on or something, um, is that a fair thing for the government to do? And I assume you don't charge junk fees yourself. Well, it's funny, you know, the airline industry, we've been trying to find a way to get in the State of the Union address for years. And boy, we got it. <laughs> All right, work. Um, so is, that, is there anything changing now or are you going to? No, I mean, um, I think, again, the good thing about our business model is, yes, we have different types of fares. And but you get a lot included that you don't pay for. You know, we offer free Wi-Fi. There's no charge. Free TV. There's no charge. We don't charge for drinks or snacks. We don't charge for for water. And so you get a lot of that included. So look, I think what the government's trying to say is they want more transparency in the fair structure so people know the totality of what so are you going to go along with that? Or are you going to I think largely I think largely we do that. I mean right. I think if you go on a, on the JetBlue website and you see a price and the price you end up paying is the same price that you see when you start shopping. So when you go on JetBlue, how do you get treated? Uh they they, they know you I they know me. Um, you know, the airplanes are always beautifully clean. They're on right, time. Right, right. Uh, and you now you have two classes. You have coach and mint. Well, yeah, we have, uh, Is that right? we have, we call it core, not core, coach, not but it's coach. the same as coach. Well, it's not because it's got more legroom. And, um, and, mint. and then mint is our business class that business. we have in certain routes. Okay, in certain routes. And what's the advantage? What, what advantage do you get by being in mint? Uh, well, first of all, you're going to save a lot more money than if you're buying another airline's business class ticket. Okay. Um, so, for example, since we started flying to London, our business class fares were about 50% of what the competition is charging. You're going to get private a private suite with the door. You're going to get amazing food. You're going to have amazing crew members, um, best in the industry, in my opinion. Uh, and the most important thing, free Wi-Fi, but the most important thing, especially if you're a soccer fan, is you can watch free live Premier League soccer from your TV. Okay. Well, well, well that, that should certainly clinch it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, the United States government, um, well, let me ask, when I was a young staff person, I worked on Capitol Hill and we were, I was standing on the Senate floor and they were passing the Hart-Scott-Rodino Act when I remember Senator Hart got up and said, this is just a notification process. Companies just notify the government what they're going to do, not going to slow anything down. Um, so how long have you been trying to get your spirit uh, acquisition done? Is that right? Yes, that's what they told me. Wow. Um, I'll, I need to raise that. Um, we've been working on this now for several months. Um, and honestly, you know, we, we hope to hear soon uh, what's going to happen next, whether we are going to be able to 
proceed with this with regulatory approval or whether you know we're going to get sued and, and, and go to court. So in our country, the two agencies decide or government entities decide is either Justice Department or the FTC. You have the Justice Department doing this? Correct, Department of Justice. Yeah. Okay, so you've been waiting seven months or so for this decision? Well, you know, look, it is complex. It does take some time. But yeah, seven months since we um, started uh, with what they call a second request, which is a sort of the uh, investigative part. So when they do that and uh, when they come to you and they say, guess what, we're not going to approve it. You can say, all right, well, I'm not, the deal's over, or you can go into court. What you know, are you going to do? We're going to go to court. Okay. Yeah. We have, with the, the law hasn't changed. The facts are on our side. And the best, you know, look, I, where we agree with the Department of Justice is that there has been a lot of consolidation and there is a limited amount of competition in many places. We, but, you know, how can you have a situation where four airlines have 80% between them and the rest of us have 20% between them? You don't really see that level of dominance anywhere else. And so a bigger JetBlue taking the best of JetBlue and the best of spirit, allow this airline to grow to 8 to 9%. We're going to create an amazing airline based around right. our people and our consumers, and we're going to make the industry much more competitive. So your competitors, your big four, are they against this acquisition? I have no idea. They, they haven't said anything? I just... Honestly, when you've got 20% in the market, you don't have to worry about what anyone else thinks. All right. Well, new, new, normally, uh, Justice Department, the FTC, they... They kind of stop things if if um, customers, not competitors, but if customers are not happy. Are, there cust are the customers complaining about this or anywhere, or do you know they are? No, no I would say, um, um, you know, I think, well, I know that the vast majority of people um, that we've talked to are very excited about this. I mean, if you're in Fort Lauderdale and you look at JetBlue and Spirit today and between the two, we're going to fly to 250 markets. We're going to fly to 90 of the hun top 100 markets out of Miami. I don't have to drive to Miami anymore um, to Thanks. fly on one of our competitors. So um, how many employees might lose their jobs if you did this acquisition? Zero. Zero? Yes. OK. You know, uh, David, in JetBlue's 23-year history, we've never furloughed a single crew member for the entire time. Really? Ah. OK. Well, let's speak about the history of JetBlue. Who, who founded JetBlue, and when was it started? It was founded by an amazing serial entrepreneur called David Newman, um, who um, founded it in the late 90s. The first flight was on the 11th of February 2000, um, Buffalo to JFK, and then JFK to Fort Lauderdale, ironically. And um, yeah, David uh, David's just built this amazing airline, and it's been an honor for all of us to continue in his footsteps. Now, he's uh, got another airline he's starting now in the United States. Does he call you with tips from time to time, or...? Uh, yeah, he calls me a lot of tips. Um, um, but uh, no, so uh, he was, uh, yeah, so JetBlue then, well, before that, he was at Morris Air, sold that to Southwest. Uh, well, he, 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 then he was at, he founded JetBlue. Then he went to Crate Azul, uh, a Brazilian airline, very successful airline. Then he went to Tap Air Portugal um, to take over the uh, Portuguese airline. Um, and then he came back to the U.S. to start another airline called Breeze. Okay. So you like more airlines, I assume. Right? I love, yeah, I love more and airlines. And the, the, the United, in the 1970s, the United States, we deregulated airlines. For that, we, we, the airlines uh, were told by the government where they could fly and what they could charge. You think deregulation has been a plus for the airline industry or a minus? I think overall it's been a huge plus because it's created a... Um, you know, it's created an, uh, an, an industry that has kind of grown, created a lot of jobs... Um, create a lot of opportunity for people. I think the problem is that as we got towards the back end of that, it just led to a lot of over consolidation. And unfortunately, you know, when you've got three large legacy airlines that whose business models are very focused around business travelers um, and, you know, lo lower growth rates, it does create an upward momentum on fares. So uh, what about for investors? I mean, uh, the investors community, they don't generally love the airline industry because they're it's very cyclical. Uh, Warren Buffett famously said that if there had been a capitalist at Kitty Hawk, he would have shot Orville right down because um, the amount of in the money yeah. lost in the industry has been so much. Uh, is that unfair? Uh, no. Um, I, I think it has been challenging. What I would say is that, you know, we, we would definitely see momentum um, in the back half of the last decade. And I think, you know, airlines were sort of... Uh, hitting a groove, you know, there was, you know, uh, they were making money around the world at a, at a net level. And then of course COVID came. And I, 
And I feel it's a bit like the analogy I give is, you know, you spend 20, 30 years pushing the car up the hill, you know, every kind of just trying to get it a bit higher, a bit higher. And then a pandemic happens and you let go of the car and it goes right back down oh. to where it came. And so we're all having to rebuild, build, rebuild our businesses again. So um, what should propel a young person to want to go into the airline industry? Uh, you joined the airline industry. You originally were in some other line of work and you got excited about this industry. Would you join the airline industry today now, knowing everything you now know? Oh, yeah. It's so you much fun. You know, I mean, who doesn't like being in an industry that's 24-7? You never know what's coming tomorrow. You don't control much of what's going on. Uh, you're, you're high profile in the media. Um, and um, uh, I mean, you, you and everything have to worry about PE ratios. Either. Yeah. So, no, I mean, <laughs> a PE ratio. Um, so, but you know what? I wouldn't change it for anything. It is okay. so. You're happy. It's, um, I'm as happy as Larry. So your mother is alive in her 90s, did you say? Tell me. She's in her 80s. 80s. Yeah. So, uh, and she flies on it. Does she tell everybody her son is a CEO? Uh, she knows I, I, I don't really share exactly what I do. Because oh. um, oh. sometimes I'm not sure myself. Um, but, but she has flown. And, um, you know, I mean, I was at 19 years at British Airways. She did like British Airways a lot. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a gradual process. Okay. Okay. So today, uh, if somebody is here and says, I, I'm going to fly to, to uh, let's say, Fort Lauderdale uh, from New York or from Washington. Do you fly from Washington as much? From uh, we do fly from uh, Washington, Washington. Okay. DC, yeah. So the reason I should fly or they should fly on JetBlue is, in the end, if you're just going one leg down, yeah. it's cheaper and better service. One, saying. the best people, the best service. Two, it's cheaper. And three, you know, the most leg women coach, the free TV, free Wi-Fi, drinks and snacks. Right. Now, uh, a number of years ago, the FCC uh, looked at whether they should let people talk on airplanes. Yes. And it was 99% said over our dead body because yeah. people don't want to listen to other people talking. Yeah. That's not going to change, right? Uh, I don't think that's going to change. Um, I mean, people sometimes talk too loudly to the person next to them on the airplane. Um <laughs> But no, I don't think that's going to change. We don't allow it. I don't see that happening. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about the responsibility as of a passenger to not recline their seat? Um, is that a responsibility not to do it? Or people complain about this? Or how does that work? When you give people plenty of legroom, it doesn't matter if the person in front is reclining or not. Right. Okay. Right. Right. But people don't, but people are okay. Nobody complains about that, right? It's okay to recline a bit. You know, um, I think, I think it's okay to recline a bit. Um, you got to get the recline. You know, it's when the seat's broken, not on JetBlue, of course, and you sort of go all the way back. But hello. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> if I join JetBlue uh, uh, Mosaic, what are the benefits I'm getting? Am I getting cheaper fares eventually? Or what are the benefits you get by being in your frequent flyer club? Well, have I got a chance of getting you one of our airplanes? Well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you have any golf streams? I don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. Would it make a difference? I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, um, lot, lots of, uh, you know, lots of benefits, including, uh, you know, we, we offer free, free upgrades. We offer okay. additional points, uh, free drinks okay. on board, priority boarding. and Free and, alcohol drinks? Uh, a free alcohol drink. Yeah. Really? Yeah. They don't charge that for that? Not for mosaic. Mosaics can oh, okay. have free alcohol. Yeah. No limits to how much you can drink. Well, that's, I, I, I think, try to be careful. Yeah, we're, we're careful, yeah. Okay, so to the, today, um, the pilots that you have, I assume they're compensated roughly the same rates as the big four? Uh, at the moment, they are, uh, we, we have had a, uh, a pay rate adjustment, actually. So right now, they're, they're ahead of their big four colleagues. Really? Yeah. And uh, their wow. pilots are awesome. So they deserve okay. it. So right now, your workforce, how many employees do you have? Uh, we have about twenty four to twenty five thousand and the diversity d e i would you say what would you say it is well i you know it is uh it is work in progress i mean as a company, we have a very diverse group okay. you know we have the same challenges as many uh to make sure that our leadership team is diverse, but we have a couple of great programs I want to spend ten seconds on first of all, for years we've had a program called JetBlue Scholars, so if you join JetBlue and you don't have have a degree. Uh, we have a program that will get you a degree in a very low cost way. Secondly, we have a gateway program. Uh, you know, um, 
if you want to become a pilot or a maintenance technician and you've worked for JetBlue for three years, uh, we will train you to become a pilot or maintenance technician. By the way, that extends to your family uh, as well. Um, and we've now, what, and what we're seeing is the, because these programs are more affordable, they're more accessible, uh, and we're seeing a much more diverse group of, uh, of our crew members come through them. Okay. So um, let me ask you about the uh, uh, safety issues today. Um, right now, all the airlines are the same in terms of safety. And, and basically, there haven't been many crashes in many, many years of commercial airlines and so forth. Uh, are you comfortable that the air traffic system is as safe as it could be or can it be modernized in some ways? Well, the system definitely needs to be modernized, but it's safe. And, you know, I think that the danger is always complacency and yeah. making sure that every time a flight push, I mean, it is a modern miracle, don't you think? 20,000 flights a day in the U.S., they all push back full of people, bags and fuel. They fly in the air, they land, right. they take, and then they go around and do it again. It is a modern miracle. And, you know, I'm very proud of the efforts of every year. I'm, so, and, uh, and it's an industry that keeps it safe, but we can't be complacent and we have to continue to look at where it's not going as well as it should and correcting it. So uh, what about lost baggage? Uh, some people say that baggage sometimes gets lost. And now you probably don't have that big a problem. You don't have that many connections because your your people are flying directly yeah. from one site to another. But is that a complaint that you get still? I don't know what lost baggage is. What is okay. it? Well, no, no. Well, yeah. no it, it is a, it is a, you know, um, yeah, we don't, so we don't have as much as many because you mainly it's on connections. That's when you have the highest risk, but we, we do have lost bags and, you know, it's about um, investing in technology. It's about making sure our procedures are good to try and minimize that. And then also when people lose bags, you, you, you give them comfort that, you know, that we, right. we know where it is. You know, one of the challenges now is people have these air tags in the bags. So sometimes they know better than we do where the bag is. And we got to figure out a way of tapping when, into that. Technology. When people say they lose their bags, what percentage of you actually find them? Oh, most, most fine. Find I mean, them. the vast majority of bags will be on the next flight somewhere. Okay. Um, then people lose their bags. They say they had diamonds in them or things like that. And they, that yeah, right? we've lost a lot of diamonds. Um, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I mean, um, that can look there, you know, I think there's a, um, there is a small part of uh, that that goes on, but you know we we have some systems that can sort of help manage that if where there is fault and manage it. So, how would you compare the U.S. internal um, aircraft and airplane system with what you saw in in England or in Europe? Are we safer here in, than in Europe? We have better service in Europe. How are we different? How are we different than Europe or in London, which you know are pretty well? No, I think the system in Europe is extremely safe as well. I, I certainly wouldn't want to say the U.S. is any more or less safe. And, you know, both those organizations work. I think one of the biggest challenges in Europe, which you don't have here in the U.S., is that when I grew, when I started my career in the late 80s, there was this talk of a single European sky. You know, we're still waiting for it. Uh, because each country in Europe wants to maintain sort of jurisdiction right. over its sort of airspace. And so it's not always as efficient um, as it is in the U.S. for that reason. So um, you rose up uh, to be the CEO of this airline. What would you say your skill set was where you were? I have no you're, idea. You're a, fin <laughs> you're a finance person. You're no. an engineer. No. What was what? your uh, operations? What was your skill set that enabled you to rise up? I, I have no idea, honestly. Um, maybe I was promoted to get me out of the way from doing some real damage. But um, no, look, I think, um, you know, I, I started in this injury. It's all I've done. I was very lucky enough to work across different parts of the airline at an early, well, early and then not so early age. I was actually very late getting promoted. And I, um, yeah, there you go. Um, but but I was doing a lot of sideways moves to learn the, the company. And I think... Um, Maybe not. There's not enough people in the industry who take the time right. or trouble. So, if that. I was looking for a good investment, would you say an investment in a airline would be a good investment? What about your your company? I think our stock price is only got a low. low. It can't get, get much lower, right? Uh, it, it's not going to get low. It's only going to go up. Go up. I agree. Yeah. Um, it's gone. Uh, it's low. But your market cap is, you know, relatively modest, isn't yeah. that? How can you be such a big airline and have a market cap of under three billion dollars? I think it is. Well, that's why we're gonna we're gonna merge with Spirit. We're gonna create this big airline, and the share price is gonna be up okay. From there. And and previously, you had said you thought there was too much consolidation yeah. in the industry. Now you say there isn't enough, or there should be more. Well, the problem is you can't unring that bell, right? You've got four with eighty percent, and the question is, how do we 
how do we make the industry more competitive? There is something called the JetBlue effect, which didn't come from our PR department. It was actually coined by MIT over 10 years ago, which when JetBlue starts flying on a market against the legacy airline, prices come down and the legacy airlines also compete on service. So that is a fact. It's as true today as it was 20 years ago because we are turning up with a great product that is a real alternative for people to fly on. Legacy airlines bring down their fares to match JetBlue. By doing that across a bigger geography, we will make the industry even more competitive. Uh, the biggest factor in the price of uh, tickets going up, is that the price of fuel? In other words, that's the thing you can't get at all control, right? Yeah, I think there's two issues at the moment. First of all, fuel is high, as we know, significantly higher than it was in 2019. And secondly, the industry still has a lot of constraints. And so there isn't as much capacity that has come back as there is demand. So the demand is still outstripping our ability to put capacity in the market. And so, um, you know, that is going to take another year or so probably to normalize. Um, fuel will hopefully come down. Uh, and I think some of those uh, some of those uh, issues will course correct. And do you have you have algorithms such that you can figure out how you should change your should reduce your fares um, day by day based on demand or something? How how do you decide what the fare is going to be? And is it ever the case that somebody's sitting here on a plane and somebody sitting right next to them is paying a different fare? Oh yes, probably, probably yeah, that yeah. happens. Yeah, because it really a lot of it is when do you buy your ticket and what um, you know what restrictions are you willing to take or not take in terms of the fare that you're that you're buying and so um every day every flight is monitored and you know there's a price at every sort of uh you know there's there's, there's 26 inventory buckets on an airplane and when people say well why is there 26 inventory buckets i say it's because there's 26 letters in the alphabet and and um uh, and then uh, you know the, the 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 flight will be open and closed based on how demand is booking against that forecast. Okay, so the uh, let me ask you about the the restrooms in airplanes. Yes, they're very small, um, and sometimes I'm told people smoke in them. Have you ever had that problem? Um, I think the smoke alarms work pretty well, so I don't think that's a huge issue. It does obviously happen from time to time. I think a lot goes on in the bathrooms, um, <laughs> but. Um, People stuff everything down the toilet and it doesn't work anymore. I actually, I was on a flight the other day. We were trying to get unclogged uh, because some stuff had gone down there. On but, JetBlue um, or some yeah, other airlines? I was actually on JetBlue. But you're the CEO. Did you get it fixed? or? I got my gloves on and I got it. No, so we'll leave it there. Okay. Um, people are eating. But um, but no, um, the yeah, the bathrooms are are pretty small. Um, that's true. You ever mentioned that to the Airbus people? You could fix it or make a bigger... Actually, you could fix that, Jeff. We need bigger bathrooms. Yeah. So um, when will you think the government of the United States is going to come up with a decision on whether or not you're going to be able to buy spirit? Is that going to be in a month or two or three? Hopefully, hopefully within the next month. Um, we'll see. And suppose they say it's going to take another six months. I mean, can you just sometimes people go ahead and close these deals and they say, go ahead and sue me in court. I'm going to close it anyway. Well, I think the way, way the way the process works is that um, uh, it, they they'll let us know by a certain date um, that, that date to be sort of agreed um, okay. whether they plan to um, uh, you know allow us to proceed or whether they plan to sue to block it. All right, if they do try to block it and you go into court, yeah, and you lose, yeah, then what are you going to do? Well, we're focused on winning. We've got great okay. facts. The law hasn't changed. Everyone we meet really wants this to happen. Um, and you know, we're very confident in that case. Okay. Sometimes people, when they close these deals before the government allows them to do it, the government doesn't usually unwind them, but I won't give you antitrust advice, but that's, <laughs> um, that's sometimes you see that happening. Okay. Um, so what is the main message you want to give the people here about JetBlue? And by the way, where did the name JetBlue come from? Uh, well, the name Dave. So David Newman and uh, Amy, who was the head of marketing at the time, came out with. They were they were struggling. Rob Land was in JetBlue at the time. They they were originally going to do chocolate, and then it was going to be taxi. But the air traffic controllers didn't like the idea of taxi four four to taxi way four one, um, and so sense. they ended up with JetBlue. And I think it literally happened a day or two before the announcement of the new airline. And so they were scrambling to get all the. Um, uh, all the stuff done. But look, I think that, you know, we are excited about the role that we play in aviation. We're proud to be um, part of the industry here. We're very proud to fly all of you. 
We're proud to have lots of great crew members work for us. And we just, did, by getting this deal done, we're going to be bigger okay. and we're going to do a bit more of what you all love. All right. So how many people are going to fly more JetBlue than they did before now? Okay. Yeah. There you go. And how many people think that the Spirit Airlines deal should be allowed to go through? How many? Yeah. Okay. So we very good. We should point that out to the Justice Department. Yeah. The people people are, are demanding this. Yeah. They are demanding it. So, okay. Well, look, I, you've done a really good job. You've got an impressive career. Um, and uh, final question is, if I really want a good investment, JetBlue would be a good investment because, you know, you're low price right now and uh, can only go one way, right? Yeah, I think, you know, we have a uh, we have a great plan and uh, there's only one way, which is to be bigger and to uh, be bolder. And that's what we're going to do. And our, everyone's going to benefit our crew members, our customers and our shareholders. Right. And any of your children go into the airline industry? They were all uh, smart enough not to do that. Oh, really? But I mean, you would recommend young people go in. I tried. Yeah, you know, my wife was a my wife was a pilot. My wife was uh, one of the first um, uh, uh, pilots when the World Air Force first started taking women. Uh, you, did she ever do JetBlue? No, no. This was a long time oh. ago, and um, so we tried very hard to get our daughter to consider a career in aviation, but as a pilot, but not no. having any of it. Okay. Well, good luck to you. Thank you for your Thank time. You, and I hope everything works out with the Justice Department. You. I'm sure they'll be quickly. Okay. Thank Thanks a lot.